Hello, welcome. So this week we're going to talk about fallacies, uh, in particular the category of fallacies that are referred to as invalid inferences. So we've talked a little bit about fallacies before, but these type of fallacies are a fallacy of type where they're not giving valid structured conclusions. So we talked a little bit about before, invalid and valid structures, and how we get to a valid structure, which is conclusive support for a particular conclusion versus invalid structures that do not give conclusive support. Now, some types of structures that are invalid, invalid structures are useful. A lot of it's used in science where we use statistics and probabilities, which are not absolutely conclusive. However, they tend to be good arguments. However, there are some that are just blatantly, clearly not good arguments, like just mistakes in reasoning. And these are the types that we're gonna discuss right now. So one of the main ones is ad hominem. Ad hominem in Latin means to the person. And you see this a lot within politicians where they may be attacking the opponent on a personal basis, but they're not actually talking about the issues that they're discussing. Uh, Donald Trump was really famous for this. Um, pointing out flaws in the person's character or personal life and not really anything relevant to the topic at hand that they were discussing. So you also see this in uh, law as well. So expert witnesses uh, in a trial, you see this where, you know, and interesting enough, they're usually scientific <laughs> uh, scientists, right? Uh, giving an expert scientific advice on a particular issue. However, the lawyers on the other hand, uh, let's say on cross-examination, may try to discredit them by pointing out some sort of personal uh, issue. For the most part, they're not really relevant. Uh, you know, whether this particular scientist was uh, pulled over for driving under the influence may not have anything to do with their uh, expert opinion regarding physics and, you know, bullet trajectories or anything like that. Clearly, it's not relevant. Uh, some might be relevant in the sense of that maybe the scientist has affiliations with a particular uh, company that might be being sued. Uh, are they receiving money or benefits from particular individuals uh, that are connected? Maybe a conflict of interest. Um, but for the most part, uh, these type of uh, attacking the person and not attacking the argument are clearly fallacious and not really a good arguments. Now, another type of argument related to that is guilt by association. So guilt by association is, again, what kind of company you keep, that's how you're being judged on, uh, without any particular direct evidence. So there may be suspicion, right? So maybe uh, in a court case trial, uh, the client is, you know, hanging around uh, convicted uh, mafia individuals, right? In a, my imaginary situation. Uh, does that mean that they're related in activity? They're part of the mafia? No, it doesn't. Uh, is this some, look suspicious? Perhaps, and maybe that's what the, trial is based on. But guilt by association, as you can see, is very problematic, you know, um, because a family member may be convicted of a crime doesn't necessarily mean you know, you're guilty of crimes related that, to that or anything like that, right? So that's where some failings happen with regards to guilt by association. Two wrongs make a right. You see this <laughs> a lot sometimes in most friends and family. Uh, classic example might be like, well, maybe cheating on the test. Uh, I'll catch a student cheating and we'll say like, 
where everybody else is cheating, see how, you know, other people's guilt does not negate their cheating, right? Doesn't make their cheating any better because everybody else is cheating. Um, that might be an issue. Uh, other things is like, well, you know, if you point out an, um, an argument, let's say with a, a family member, your partner or something, it's like, well, you know, telling each other about chores, like, well, you don't take out the trash. Well, you don't take out the trash either. Uh, you see how oh, two rocks don't make a right. Uh, so I might have to admit, I guess the, but the true thing would be like, if I was, if I was accused of that, it was true. I was like, well, okay, you have a point. I, I do need to stretch. You know, I should uh, give effort. It's very difficult for us to do those type of things. Uh, we may be feeling a lot of emotions at that point. Uh, I'm being judged, uh, fighting with fire, fire with fire, right? Uh, I'll throw back whatever they give me. Uh, but they don't have any clear, justified, logical reason, um, more as a reaction, right? So this is the hypocrisy element to it. You may feel it's very hypocritical for those to point out that of something that they are also guilty of. Uh, but like I said, Hypocrisy doesn't justify, right? Doesn't make it better because maybe they don't throw up the trash either. Doesn't make my responsibility any less. Uh, obviously, it might be the mature thing would be both parties, you know, uh, admit and right come to terms with that and to work out a system where they can both, uh, you know, maybe alternate each up the trash or something like that. Now, Somewhat related is a tilt to tradition or popularity. So everyone is doing it. Why can't I do it? Right? Or tradition, we've always done it like that in my family. So, you know, why change? As you can see, they don't really have good justifications other than kind of going with the crowd going with the family tradition or something like that. There's no real reason necessarily for it. So just because everybody's going with it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Uh, you can see this historically. Uh, justifications for slavery and segregation in the United States. Obviously, there's still slavery being practiced around the world, but uh, a historical example would be well, that a lot of slave owners and people who were advocating for slavery uh, in the United States prior to the Civil War would do so on based on the fact that that's tradition. That's how their families live for generations. Uh, they own this plantation and that's, you know, uh, the slaves are go back to generations as well. So that's part of the tra tradition of the South. Those were actually used uh, in defense of slavery. Uh, and then segregation later on in, in United States history, um, the ad like arguing for separate bathrooms, uh, facilities, um, schools, all that was also a reach for, but well, maybe both tradition and popularity of it within that community. Uh, that's how everybody did it, so that's what they thought was the right thing to do. But obviously, there's problems with that, and that doesn't really make sense. So you may want to ask yourself, and can we consider some of your own traditions within your family, right, or your community? Do those make sense? Even though that's the way things have been done for so long, uh, are there logical reasons? And maybe reconsidering changing, you know, those traditions, uh, sometimes they're not, they're very harmful in some cases. So thinking about that. Non sequiturs, that's where you bring in irrelevant reasons. So something is, does not follow, that's why the transitions, um, it does not fall into an argument. So you give a premise or something that that obviously doesn't have anything to do with the conclusion. 
um, some examples, right, that it simply defy logic. Uh, is that, I'm trying to think of an example where, uh, for example, Obama, uh, when he was being um, first running for office uh, and then later for re-election, opponents would point out that, you know, his, his name has, um, is Middle Eastern in origin, right? Uh, and that we're fighting a battle with the Middle East, uh, uh, terrorist groups, and that that has an uh, affiliation that's kind of also guilty by association, right? Um, all, all those type of things uh, are really irrelevant, right, to whether he be the president or not. Um, so it doesn't follow when people simply just kind of put in, you know, some other random piece of information as uh, a reason why this would be good or could not be a good choice. The next one, I think equivocation is something that I really like to talk about with students. It's really common, but very tricky to identify. So, Equivocation is when you use a term or expression in one place to mean one thing and in another person means something different. So what I mean by term or expression is some sort of claim, uh, definition, or uh, word, and using two different definitions, right, or meanings in, and trying to connect those two. Now, this is something I think the book doesn't do very well. You use those two, maybe have one word, but use it in two different ways, and then try to make a connection between two ideas. That's where the mistake happens. So it's hard to notice the shift when somebody does that. This is why it's really tricky. So there's a lot of ambiguity, and in that ambiguity, some people kind of try to use that to their advantage. Um, a lot of the examples in the book talk about um, in consumerism, trying to sell you something. They may say, you know, the uh, only contains natural sugars or something like that, uh, nor official sugars. But, you know, that, what do we mean by sugars and what does that have to do with maybe health? You have to take a little closer look, right? Um, so one example, I can give you a very silly example at first, and then I'll give you a more serious example. And you can kind of maybe see where the connection is in the fact that uh, if it's not obvious, it's hard to tell. So one example on the internet I saw, it's a good example, and a kind of a silly example was, Miley Cyrus, the celebrity, right? Uh, the first purpose is Miley Cyrus is a star. The second sentence says, Miley, I'm uh, sorry, uh, a star is a large ball of gas. So they're saying, first, Miley Cyrus is a star. And the next, they're going to say, and a star is a big ball of gas. Therefore, here comes a conclusion, why it's silly. Then we can conclude that Miley Cyrus is a big ball of what gas? So see how it doesn't make sense, obviously, because in the first sentence, they're saying Miley Cyrus is a star, that's obviously a star is referencing a celebrity. And in the second one, a star is a big ball of gas. A star there is referring to the physical object like our sun. And then making that connection at the end. That is true for one definition, it's true for the other definition. Now that's a silly example, but obvious, right? A trickier example is going to be this. 
You see this in a lot of abortion debates. Let's say the first premise states a human, a fetus is a human being. So let me say that again. A fetus is a human being. In the next statement, they'll say a human being has rights, including the right to life. Therefore, a fetus has a right to life. Now, this is trickier. Let's go back to the first premise. A fetus is a human being. Well, we're using human being in one sense, right? How are we connecting fetus to human being? That on a biological sense that a fetus has perhaps the same uh, biological DNA, right, makeup as a human being, a homo sapien. So that's one way. Then notice what they do in the second premise. The second premise is going to state that a human being deserves rights, including the right to life. Now, human being is not used as referencing a biological definition, rather human being in the second premise is talking about, well, whether the, in a political, social, or ethical sense, is this one where we talk about rights, you know? So the definition is a different type of definition and a different use of human being. We're talking about a political, social, or ethical right, not a biological fact. Then notice what they do at the end, the conclusion. Then the fetus has a right to life. So they connected the biological definition with the social definition. So you're using one term, human being, in two different ways. And it does mislead you, the reader, for the conclusion, right? And this is a type of equivocation that's very common, and, and a lot of people do not catch. You can't combine the two into one term, one word, with two different meanings. It's a very tricky fallacy. They keep in mind those type of fallacies. Now, the next one is very obvious at first when it's silly, but maybe not so obvious when it's a more serious issue. So built to ignorance is that, well, you don't have any evidence uh, or no one's going to refute you, no one's going to argue against you, so it must be right, it must be true. Uh, example, silly example would be you know, I don't know what those strange lights in the sky are. I have no evidence. No one's going to say anything against me. So I'm going to conclude they must be aliens, right? See how we kind of jump to that. Uh, you'll see this on other historical examples uh, where, you know, people will claim, well, we don't know how the pyramids were built. Uh, if we can't explain it, then it must be aliens that helped the Egyptians build the pyramids. See how um, aliens building pyramids, <laughs> just because we have no evidence on how they, or lack of evidence, right? We're not too sure how they built it. Uh, it's not proof. Uh, more subtle ways that I can tell, uh, this has happened in my life, uh, actually at work. Some people say, well, uh, I remember a situation and they say, well, we don't have a lot of good evidence for something that students are doing well because of this. So it must not be working. So since they didn't really check it out and then they already made an assumption well that it's not working. Yeah, and I have to, I, unfortunately I have to point out to them, <laughs> you know, that's lack of evidence is not evidence. Now, another one that's interesting and, and used a lot 
uh, you'll start to notice is appeals to different types of emotion. So using emotion to try to prove a point, you know, without any good reasons to back it up. This is a this is why we may use pity, may feel make somebody feel sorry for uh, some situation or person, and that's why they should do it. You know, uh, no one helps this guy, so you know you should go out there and help him. And so. Is there a good reason to help this individual? That's never really discussed. Rather, it's focused on feeling bad for a person to do something. Uh, guilt, guilt trips, right? May fall under this. We're saying, well, you know, I'm going to make the person feel guilty by telling them, you know, I'm all, I don't feel they care about me. They don't love me. And that's why they should do this for me or that for me. Uh, fear can also be used, and politicians are notorious for doing this, where they use fear to undermine, you know, evidence in some cases. So, you know, this is why we need to uh, attack a country or start a war or something, because, you know, the threat they have to us, we have to kind of act before. Uh, unfortunately, in a lot of cases in the United States history fell into the, under this fallacy. The Vietnam was one of those cases where the fear of communism spreading, you know, required us to intervene. Uh, because in the end, it wasn't effective. Uh, um, the North Vietnamese did still, um, invade southern Vietnam, uh, it, the United States' uh, involvement did not help with, at all. So, and, but however, notice communism didn't spread dramatically uh, regardless. So be careful about those type of things. Also, um, you can see this in advertisements as well, where people, uh, like companies will use this uh, fear to get you to buy services or your, or items, right? Um, maybe for protection, you might have to buy a gun to protect yourself and you use fear. Uh, the advertisement may show somebody trying to break in and the only way, you know, solution is to get your gun or uh, security. Uh, systems, uh, home security systems, they're going to try to convince you with those commercials where somebody's breaking in as well, that the only solution is, you know, if you want to keep your family safe, you have to pay X amount of money a month uh, for this very expensive high-tech security system. Uh, those are all used to, as you can see, sell you things, convince you services are needed, they're necessary. And there's no, usually they try to present it as there's no alternative. That's the only way it's going to, you know, save you. They're, whatever they're selling is the only way for the solution. Another very tricky uh, type of fallacy, or two different particular types of fallacy, composition and division. Composition is when you assume that a particular item must have a certain property some sort of characteristic because all of its parts have that property, right? So you'll see this in a salesman. This is where consumerism and selling new things uh, come back into play. So you'll think of a situation, let's say, Let's say um, all the parts to this car are very expensive. They're top quality parts. Therefore, the car itself must be a top quality car, right? So I assume that a particular item, let's say the car, must have the property of being a very good car because all the parts that were used to build it are very good. 
Um, well, as you can know, just just because you have good tires and good engines and stuff doesn't necessarily make a well-designed car. Uh, there's plenty of examples in real life where, you know, the car as a whole turned out to be not very good despite uh, having good materials. Another type of uh, fallacy with regards to the vision is when kind of going the opposite way, where you assume all parts of an item have a particular property because that because the item as a whole has it. So you're kind of going the other way. Um, so this could be also positive and negative. Uh, So I think a good example of this was maybe a movie. Uh, my girlfriend uh, doesn't care for Nicolas Cage, doesn't like Nicolas Cage as an actor. Uh, so he's part of the movie, right? He's an actor in the movie. And we assume all parts of him have a particular property because that I am as a whole has, right? So let's say she doesn't like any of the actors in the movie, including Nicolas Cage, well then obviously the movie is not going to be very good. See how that's kind of an issue there. Uh, actually, a real life counter example did happen. Uh, we did watch a movie with Nicolas Cage and she actually did enjoy it, uh, despite not liking him as an actor. And she did admit it was a good movie. So you can see how we rate things sometimes by, you know, well, one part of it is bad and then all of it's bad or or all parts of it are bad. So the whole thing must be bad. Uh, this is a very tricky sort of thing. So be, uh, be aware of that. The next fallacy is slippery slope. This is a really famous fallacy in, in speeches and debates, politics. Uh, kind of using fear as well. So you'll notice some of these fallacies overlap sometimes, where you can have two fallacies in, in the same argument. Uh, guilty of this, guilty of two fallacies, right, in one argument. So you could use fear and you could use the slippery slope at the same time. And let me explain what the slippery slope argument is about or fallacy. It's when you take, uh, you warn against the first action being taken and another and another will be taken leading to undesirable consequences. So it's kind of snowballed because you did one bad step at the beginning, everything will snowball and everything else will be bad and will be a huge disaster. See how you kind of maybe using fear a little bit to kind of convince somebody. So the argument is suggesting here that whatever justifies the first step would justify all the others. But since the last step doesn't justify that first step, it's the theme. So I uh, heard this a lot with same-sex marriage, this fallacy that if you allow same-sex people to marry, then you know we'll, soon people will be doing anything they want, and then we'll have people marry cars and children and animals and whatever. And so we can't have that. So the only way to stop that is that we prevent same-sex human adults, right? Um, from their, this is, as you can see, is a very fallacious type of reasoning. Uh, just because one thing happens doesn't mean it's gonna end a disaster or it's gonna be the cause of everything else. Very difficult uh, to claim something like that. You're kind of also predicting the future in a sense too, right? That all, all these things will happen. Well, same-sex marriage was legalized, right? Uh, and we didn't see the large repercussions that people warned about. So that's where it's kind of an element of fear, I think, too, as well, to kind of scare people from making that initial step. Uh, I see this also, and um, I remember uh, I was advocating for a uh, for, to the city for a bike share program uh, prior to the city having any sort of type of bike share. Uh, 
But there were fears. People would steal the bikes. No one would use them. Uh, it'd be a complete disaster. They'd steal them and send them to Mexico for profit or something like that. Turns out none of that happened. <laughs> Once they installed the bike share program, uh, but there was that essential fear that, well, if this happens, if you spend money this way, then it's going to be a complete disaster. And none of that was the case. So, with that, um, that can kind of conclude this chapter on fallacious reasoning and arguments from an invalid inference. We saw Kind of to review, we saw slippery slope, composition and division, uh, pity, fear, right, using emotions, uh, ignorance, not knowing or having evidence, trying to use that as evidence, equivocation, remember using one word, get two different definitions and then trying to connect those two ideas together. Uh, non sequiturs, right? Just including irrelevant information uh, has nothing to do with the issue. Appeals to traditional popularity, right? Using a culture's traditions or what the crowd goes with, what overall community goes with, doesn't justify actions. Uh, two wrongs making a right, you know, just because someone else is guilty of, of some um, crime or some sort of wrongdoing doesn't make you innocent of that same crime, right? Um, guilt by association, we talked about that a little bit, making the, uh, just because maybe hanging around with the wrong crowds and make you a bad apple or something like that. Uh, it may, like I said, in some cases, give you suspicion, right? Uh, in my mafia case, but it doesn't, it's not evidence. You, and you'll see that also in court too, where, you know, maybe hanging, the person may be hanging around with the mafia, individuals are connected, uh, but that obviously is not proof to take the court to prove anything. And a homonym, remember, attacking the, the person, the individual, and not really the actual argument. So making uh, personal comments, personal jabs, personal attacks. So these are all types of invalid inferences that you want to watch out for. Uh, 